Welcome back, builders. I have been saving this nation as a little bit of a treat to myself. A very, very fun nation. Uh, as I think I've mentioned before, I do like the non-human nations quite a bit in the early age, especially. Just, they're cool, they're different, they're monstrous, they're magical. And this is one of those nations. Uh, we are going to be looking at Hinnom, Sons of the Fallen. Hinnom is a dry wasteland inhabited by giants. At the dawn of time on the sacred Mount Hermon, six angels in full celestial splendor descended to aid and instruct the giants of the land. The Avim were a people strong and beautiful of mind and body. They were adept students and their culture flourished under the tutelage of Gr the Grigori, the angelic watchers. But before long, the angels became enamored with the Avim and taught them things that should not be taught. Tempted by the beauty of the Avim, they took their daughters as wives and sinned before the celestial powers. Their offspring were the Nephilim, giants of godlike power and abominable to the world. The angels were imprisoned in the infernal realms for their sins, but the Nephilim were partly of this world and could not be banished by the celestial powers. The Nephilim made themselves kings over the Avim, and they fathered sons who became known as the Grephium. The Nephilim and their sons had unnatural appetites and consumed food, livestock, beasts, and finally their own offspring. With time, the Nephilim left Hinnom in search of a purpose and left their sons to rule the Avim. This is an actual nation based on like biblical mythology. The Nephilim and Hinnom, the Grigori. Very interesting. Not something a lot of people look at, actually. So kind of cool to see that uh, represented here. It is a very strong nation. I think it was definitely one of the contenders of strongest, possibly, in Dom 5. However, with the changes to blessings and uh, the changes to scales, I think they have been brought more in line with other nations, but they're still very, very strong. Quite fun to play, too. And it, they're a nation that there's a couple different ways you could play them. So I always like it when you have nations with options rather than being kind of shoehorned into the one good thing, the one thing they're good at. For national features... Our race is Raphalum Giants with Enormous Appetites. That's these big boys, this guy and these three. We have Lesser Avite and Horite Giants. So these are the Avarites, and then these are the Horites, which are the like cavemen. We've seen them in a couple other nations. And we have some Inkadu, and we've seen them notably from Ur, and unfortunately for them, enslaved by various nations. We prefer Heat Scales plus two. For our military... We have Horite Cave Dwellers. We have Inkadu Slaves, although it's only this one unit. We have Avite Giants, which we have a pretty decent variety of. Pretty high quality troops. And we do have Chariots, which is pretty cool. For Magic, we have Fire, Earth, Astral, Blood, Some Air, Nature, and Death. And I think other than Death, we have everything in at least two paths. And they're two linked paths, so you will always have a Nature 2 or an Air 2. So very strong paths. I love nations that are not overly random. I'm not relying on getting a lucky combo to do something useful. I pretty much get what I'm going to get when I do recruitments. Uh, the random is which one of the good ones I get. So very nice to have reliable, powerful magic. Our priests are weak. And we have sacred Raphite Giants. And we can perform blood sacrifices. Uh, you can take blood slaves at a temple with a blood mage, and they can sacrifice them to convert them into temple checks. So it can be quite powerful for pushing out your dominion uh, if you're getting if you're getting pushed back, or you want to maybe use that offensively. It can be very very potent because it can come as a surprise. Like normally, there's kind of a slow ebb and flow to your dominion. Being able to do blood sacrifices. If you set yourself up to do it at, let's say, three temples with a blood three guy, you can surprise somebody with nine temple checks per turn that you could just instantly start doing, kind of turn on like a light switch. Very nice. For scales and blesses, we uh, can have our heat limit up by plus one. So we can go up to heat three naturally and only down to cold one. For buildings, we get giant forts. Uh, these are pretty good infrastructure forts. It is a three level construction. So you start with the giant, I think it's palisade, and then fortress, and then we go up to giant castles. So it is a three-stage construction. 
And it's expensive. I believe the first step is 1000 and the other two steps are 800 So pretty darn pricey, but they're, they're strong. They're hard to siege down. They give decent bonuses. Pretty darn good. I think they're perfectly fine in this nation. It should be noted that not only is our infrastructure expensive here, we don't have any discounts on labs or temples, and we have expensive troops and not the most efficient researchers. So we are a nation that's going to need to be looking at funding ourselves because uh, it is it is not cheap being a giant around here. As for our sites, we have Mount Hermon, which produces two earth, two fire, and an astral. Decent income, I would say, here. Uh, fire may be a little less useful, but because of our money issues, distilling gold is a distinct possibility here. And we have Gomara, which is our sacred recruit site, and we get two blood slaves from it. So we end up with seven gems, quote-unquote. Income, which is on the higher side, pretty nice. Having uh, blood slave income just for, for free, very nice. Uh, early game, maybe you could... Throw those into some extra temple checks if you needed to, or you could just save up for some of our national blood spells, which are quite good. As for units, we have a pretty decent spread here. Um, I do feel that everyone, almost everyone, maybe these guys all have uses. No, no major stinkers here, though, surprisingly. Starting with the lowly Inkidu slave. This guy is 11 gold, 2 resources, 3 recruitment. Now, first glance, you're going to look at this guy and be like, well, this is complete garbage. What the heck? He's got a 7 attack with a fist. He has 6 morale. That is misery. Uh, it should be noted, he has a 4 gold a year upkeep. And we have a siege strength of 2 and a siege defense of 1. So what I like these guys for is I would get maybe one group of 100. And I would just use them to pop forts quickly or to scurry inside my own forts to hold up the walls for a very, very long time until I can get other things over to relieve a siege. So 100 of these guys would only be 400 gold a year. That's nothing. That's absolutely nothing. That's 100 siege strength of defense and 200 siege strength of uh, breaking in. And of course, that's in addition to any other real troops that you might have there. And we have troops that are very, very good at holding forts. So these guys actually have a pretty good place. I do tend to get at least one group of them, especially if I have kind of a, a back and forth combat going on that I want to hold up walls or pop walls. Pretty nice. Um, in combat, their only major thing is they have a lot of HP. Other than that, they are pretty much garbage. Um, they don't have enough protection. They don't have a helmet. You really don't want these guys fighting if you can help it. They are there for their utility. Next up, we have three varieties of Horites. Like all Horites, they have fire resistance, they have some cold resistance. Uh, these ones have mountain and wasteland survival, and we have dark vision 50. First variety here has a great club, only 9 attack, but 28 damage, which that's pretty squishy. We are size 4, and we wear no armor. We have this guy who is... Uh, a much better. He's the champion of them. He wears some furs, so he actually has a little protection. He has the same traits, and he actually practiced a little bit with his stick, so he has an 11 attack. That's pretty darn good. Um, 11 attacks good enough to fight basic troops, and he has dark vision. And finally, we have the Horite Hunter. Same traits again. Uh, this guy's kind of the middle between the two. He uses a stone spear, so you might be getting more repels, although at attack 10, you're not the best at it. But he also has a net. Now, why do I say these guys are okay? Well, if you want to go underground. None of our other troops here have dark vision, so they are not going to be nearly as good. So if we look at our, let's just peek at this guy, 12 attack with no night vision is going to take him down to a 9 underground. Um, and he's going to cost way more than, let's say, we were just going to use this guy. I could... I could pour these guys out as much as I could afford, essentially, uh, compared to these more expensive guys. And being underground and having an 11 attack is pretty decent. And with that dark vision, he's not going to have two bad penalties doing so. Otherwise, um, we are better at siege strength and siege defense. But 18 gold per year compared to the four you pay for the Enkidu, I would take the Enkidu over this guy, even if this guy can actually fight. Now, if I did make a squad of these guys to go conquer the underground 
and then I finished Conquering Underground, I think they're perfectly fine to use similar to the Inky Do, where I'm mainly going to use them to pop forts and hold forts up, rather than being my main combat troop. All that being said, though, we do have good magic paths for buffing, so maybe you can throw some bark skin on these guys. I mean, heck, just bark skin alone would probably make them okay. Usable troops. Usable troops. Next up, we get into our Avite line, and we have two varieties here. We have the Spearman variety, and we have the Light Infantry variety. Uh, these actually have different use cases, so I'm going to start with the Light Infantry. We're a size 4 as an Avite, and we have Wasteland Survival. That's our base traits. We have, on this unit, a Spear of Length 3, and we're, we're better than average. We have an 11 attack with it. 18 piercing damage is perfectly serviceable. Uh, that's high enough to get through most heavy armor with a lucky hit. And we have a Javelin with our 15 strength, so range 15. We're not particularly precise with it, but we hit for 17 damage, so... If you get hit by this, it is like pinning someone to the ground with a uh, wooden stake. So these are all right. I like the range 15. Uh, depending on what's coming at you, you might get two throws. Or if you're counter javeling, you'll get both your throws off. And you will kill them more likely than they will kill you. Since you have 24 HP. As for armor, these guys are perfectly serviceable. We have a ringmail cuirass. We have an iron cap. So... Smart boys that put helmets on. We have a standard shield, which results in them having a 10, although our body is actually only 9. Uh, pretty good protection on them. I like these guys. I feel like they're pretty good at expanding, uh, depending on what you're going into. Usually, like, maybe two turns of recruitment is enough to send out an expansion party. Now, you can't take on the hardest indies, but for just normal stuff, these are fine. Um, the javelins are useful. Uh against barbarians or just to throw before you go in you have decent odds of getting repels our morale is not miserable even though it's not the best very serviceable troop i usually stop recruiting these when expansion ends and i move on to better troops one of those can be the avite spearman so very very similar unit we went up to a scale mill hallberk so we went put on some heavier armor now we're at 14 protection. So now we're looking at like regular human line troops are going to start having trouble getting through 14 protection. We have the same javelin. We have the same spear. We have the same training. Uh, this guy has 13 defense. This guy has 14. So it actually goes down a little bit because of his heavier armor. But you're trading one defense for four protection. I think in this case, that's probably worth it. This is a decent, like, early mid-game troop is usually when I'm using these. So I'm having to clear out the harder expansion spots. Uh, maybe I have my cap circle so I can just afford these resource costs. Because we have gone up to 21 from 13, so it has gotten more pricey. Uh, if the javelins are still relevant to what you're fighting, that's kind of nice. Uh, we have the spears, so we're still getting repels, hopefully, or not getting repelled, depending. A usable troop. Very usable troop. Next up, we have what would be considered our standard line infantry. This is the Avite Swordsman. He is wielding a broad sword, so a length one sword, and he is relatively good with it, with a attack 12. Attack 12 is very good. I mean, most line troops are sitting somewhere at like 10 to 12 uh, defense, so you have an even or better chance of hitting them. He has slashing damage, and he hits hard enough that you will probably get through armor and get the slash bonus of an additional 25% damage after protection. And at 21, you're probably going to kill most human things and maybe even some of the weaker giants with a single hit. Otherwise, he is wearing the same harder, uh, heavier armor than our spearmen. I like these guys quite a bit. What is also nice about them, once you're fighting na uh, like national armies rather than indies, it's probably more in your favor to keep formation of a hold and attack closest or whatever scripting you're going to do than a hold and fire javelin where you tend to get like spread out a little bit and your front runners get overwhelmed and you lose a couple guys that you probably wouldn't have lost if they had stayed in formation. These guys will not have that issue because they don't they don't have any ranged weapons. I think this is where would you not want to use this? You're fighting things that can repel you well. Like, we only have a 12 morale, so we're not the best at, at ignoring it. 
Um, if you're having problems getting repelled, so somehow they're hitting your through your 14 defense, they're hitting through your protection, and you're getting repelled, maybe you need to switch over to the Spearman. In all other cases, though, once I can afford this, because these are 22 resources, like these aren't cheap. Four of these for 100 gold, and that's going to be 88 resources. This isn't cheap, but these are very reliable, good troops. You'll win grindy combat unless you're, like I said, you're getting massively out repelled for some reason. Uh, next up, I'm going to skip these two guys, and we're going to look at the Dawn Guard. Very interesting unit. Note here, he is recruiting any of our forts. He's not cap only. This is kind of like our elite bodyguard type people, elite elite soldiers. Uh, we are wearing the same defensive gear, but we have given them a Dawn Blade, which is essentially a broadsword, but we have even higher attack on it. I believe it's uh, plus two instead of plus one. We have plus defense on it, and it's magical. So we have a recruit from any fort to standard troop that has a magical weapon. Very nice. When you need magic weapons, you need magic weapons. Uh, there are plenty of my streams where we didn't have a magic weapon, and I really regretted it. Well, we can always get one now. Uh, also, the extra attack. The 14 attack is high enough that now we're starting to be able to hit, like, lower tier... Uh, glamour type troops, like high defense type troops. Uh, that's kind of the lower end. Like they're usually at like 16 to 20, but I mean, compared to 10 or 11, we have a much, much better chance of hitting. Also, our own defense is up to 16. That's that's a high defense. That's pretty darn good. These guys are going to be pretty safe. Now they have degraded down to a bronze cap, I suppose, but that's fine. There's not enough difference between the two that I, I mind that. Uh, also of note, they are bodyguards. There's a better chance that they will be with the person they're supposed to be guarding, and they get extra morale when they are on bodyguard mode. And spoilers, we have blood hunting, so we will definitely want some bodyguards. So if you can afford it, I would probably give them a couple of these guys. Uh, do note, 32 gold per year, though. Like, this is not a cheapy troop. He is truly an elite soldier. If you're fighting a nation that's using lots of ethereal troops or other troops that you can counter via magic, you might even want to try to have at least like maybe one force that has a core of these guys at the middle of your formation to kind of counteract what they're doing uh, defensively. Otherwise, other than a few of them for bodyguards, I wouldn't use these as my standard troops. While they are definitely better, they're just so expensive compared to our regular swordsmen. So, very interesting troop, gives you a lot of options, kind of frees up the feeling that, like, you have to get your sacreds or take a magic blessing or, or do something like that. Next up, let's take a look at the Avite Hornblower. Uh, like other Hornblowers, he is a banner or a standard. That just means if he's in a formation, he gives them plus one. One of his problems, though, he has combat speed 10. Combat speed 10 is just barely slower than our Spearmen. Uh, both varieties. So they would lag behind if you were just attacking. However, if you hold and fire, they'll hold the two rounds and then they'll run in front. Or they may even run sooner. So they tend to get themselves killed in those formations quite badly. With the Swordsmen, however, their speed 11 versus our 10. So if as long as we're traveling a little bit of distance, usually these guys kind of fall behind, which is perfect because while they are wearing our, our lighter gear, that's okay. They only have a dagger. And these guys are pretty dang pricey. So I don't want them dying. Uh, even on our normal line troop, we only have morale 12. So we're not the bravest troops. So getting a few of these guys in your formation is quite good. I, I, I do like doing it. Uh, they tend to die though. So it can be a little micromanagey trying to keep them su supplied with some uh, dulcet tones from our horn, our horn section here. But very useful. Their other use is Siege Bonus. Uh, one of these guys has 7.3 Siege Strength. That's pretty darn good, but we also have an upkeep of 28 gold per year. So if we wanted that same uh, Siege Strength that we were getting out of our Inky Dew, which I believe 100 of them would have been 400 gold and 200 Siege Strength, uh, for 400 gold, you're not going to get very many of these. You're not going to get 200 seed strength. So I, I take that as just a nice little bonus of having a few of these guys that are doing their main job. I don't generally consider wanting 
uh, to like have a, a crack team of horn blowers go toot toot at people and break their walls down. But maybe your mileage varies on that. Finally, we have the Avite Heavy Archer. Uh, this is an amazing troop. Uh, he shows up on some other nations and other places, and I love him even more there, but he is so good. This is an early age. Keep in mind, we we have to have the the environment that he exists in. In the early age, he has 17 protection, an actual 17 protection as an archer with a great bow. And he's not using a dagger. He's actually using a short sword. So length one. Now, is he particularly great at it? No, but tint's fine. It's fine. Great bows are, before the crossbow, the most powerful weapon that you can have for range. Asterisk there, but yeah. These are rice. What also really helps them out is because they're range, you can put these guys in formation. You can tell them to hold and fire, and they hold nice and still for you to put buffs on them. And remember, we have good buffing paths. So what could we do with them? Giant strength. We could give them bark skin. We could give them iron skin. We can give them wind guide. We can give them venom arrows, which normally aren't particularly good, but at 17 piercing damage, if you don't outright kill them, you'll damage them, and then they will get the poison. We can do fire arrows. That gives us an additional hit of, I believe it's eight armor negating fire damage. Uh, we're, you know, we're only 10 accuracy. So it's going to be a little bit of a, a wild shot when you're shooting 50 out at 10 accuracy, but that's totally fine. And they've held nice and still. Maybe even give them the fire buff and you up their attack by two and their morale by two. That's a perfectly fine second wave melee attacker. So in my mind, you have your front line either of spearmen or of swordsmen. And you have these guys as your second wave. They have a long 10 rounds. I believe you have 10 ammo. A long 12 rounds of shooting off their very damaging shots. And then when they're out of ammo, unlike most archers with their dumb daggers and their leather loincloths, they don't just run in and die. They actually could go up and fight, especially if you painted a few buffs on them. In addition, we have an iron cap and that full uh, scale male archer armor. So in terms of this game, that's just a 17 protection. Most things struggle to hit 17 protection. Like, again, we're up into, like, very heavy troops for the early age. This is, like, almost Abyssian levels of protection. I like these guys a lot. And they also, another side benefit of being able to have very strong hold archers that can hold a line, if you put your mages behind them, you don't have the problem of somebody killing your archers and then they're in your mages. Or your guys you're trying to use to protect your mages run off. So when you have weird situations where you have to defend against flyers or things that are going to flank you, you can put some archers in front and behind your casters and kind of like sandwich them in there and keep them safe. Very, very good unit. I quite, quite like these guys. Do note, 25 gold, 31 resources. So you're noticing kind of a theme here. Other than our light infantry and our junkers, these guys need a lot of resources. So you're probably going to be considering production scales. Next up, we have the Avite Charioteer. A serviceable chariot. I'll say that. We have the Wasteland Survival. However, we have two war horses or war ponies. I'm not sure what they are. We do trample because we're a chariot. However, they've only got leather barding. So five, five protection. Now, maybe this isn't quite as bad as some nations. Put these guys kind of far back. They're kind of slow. Have your amazing archers counter battery the enemy archers and kind of clear them out, hopefully, before these guys get in range. And then they can get in there and start fighting. It's unfortunate that the horses are so badly armored because the rider has 14 protection. He's pretty good. He's not going to die to getting hit, generally speaking. 24 HP plus that protection, perfectly fine. However, the horses will let you down, as is the theme of the new mount system. So if you want to use these, make sure you're watching out for archer fire. And like most chariots, you do need a critical mass. 
five of these guys are going to go in, instantly be surrounded and hacked down because they'll kill the horses. And then you'll just have a dude on the ground. Well, you might as well have just got the spearman, who at least has a shield, than him. So I would say, I don't even really want to throw out numbers, 10 plus of these in a group to, before they're actually useful. Finally, we have our sacred unit, the Raphite Warrior. These are our cap-only sacreds. These ones are kind of an all-or-nothing type unit, I feel. Uh, they are sacred. Now, do note here, this is just the regular recruitment. They do not have this cost two, cost two holy point to recruit. So you can actually get a lot of these guys compared to some of the other giants. It's a double-edged sword, though. We are size 7, so you can have a human-sized troop in with you, but we don't have any human-sized troops. So you're looking for something else to put in here to help spread out attacks. We have great HP at 55. We have really good attack. Our stats are just amazing. 16 attack on our Dawn Blades. We have that magical weapon that our Dawn Guard have. And we have a gore attack with our horns. Uh, so a two-attack giant is very nice. One of the weaknesses of very large giants is very bad attack density. So we at least have two attacks per square, which is double what most of them get. We are wearing decent gear here. We end up with 15 protection because we have a little bit of natural protection. We have natural fire resistant. We don't need to eat. However, we are gluttons. So we choose to eat the same supplies as 10 humans would eat. The, if added in Dom 6, fear of the flood. This unit is terrified of drowning. It has, been sub it has severely reduced morale during rain and underwater. Very interesting. I feel like this is something that if you're a nation fighting them, you should be looking at bringing rain to fights if these guys are showing up. I don't know what severely reduced is, but I'm assuming that's at least two to four. Um, these guys are cowards. They will run away at 10 morale. We have the Wasteland Survival. Uh, here's where things get really bad, though. Pop kill 20. Now, you're probably thinking, eh, 20, that's whatever, right? Okay, times that by 10. Now we're killing 200 pop per turn for just 10 of these guys. And every one of them increases unrest by 2 each. So we're killing 200 pop and we are raising unrest by 20 just for having 10 of these guys in a spot. If you're going to be using these, recruit them quickly and get them out and fighting. Don't have them sit around your core territories. You do not want that. It is an economic big hit to have them around. And we have very expensive stuff. We need a good economy. We cannot be killing off people for the fun of it. Especially when we're going to be blood hunting. So, good troop. I mean, you could get a very simple bless. Like, even just regen. Like, just regen on these guys and we're already humming. Maybe regen and blood surge. Uh, take these stats up to ridiculous levels after they get a single kill, which they will probably kill something with stats like this. Very, very nice. Very, very good. Quite usable. Quite like them. Um, if you did try to Hellbless, do note, I mean, 100 gold and 50 resources each. So for five of these, you need 250 resources. So you can't trash your scales too deep and still be able to get these guys. So just keep that in mind when you're designing your Pretender, if you're planning on using them. Next up, let's take a look at Commanders, Heroes, and Prophet. We're going to go ahead and start by looking at our heroes. I am not going to go one by one here. These are all very similar guys. These are children of the Gregory, essentially. These are the Nephilim that... Uh, were the original generation uh, crossbreeds, essentially. And let's, we'll just kind of peek here. They're very similar to our sacreds, where they have a lot of the same stats. Each one just has different magic pathing. So fire, astral blood, nature and blood, air and blood, fire and blood. You know, there's a pattern here, astral and blood, earth and blood. So... If you get one of these guys, hooray, they're very good. Like, there's totally nothing wrong with these guys. Some of them are, are priest level twos, some are not. They all have some level of blood and a cross path. Very, very nice. You would love to get these. Are they worth taking fortune for? Maybe. They are that good. No upkeep, just of note. Our other big blood guys are very expensive. Um, I mean, this guy has the pillar of laws that he literally hits you with. Like, that's, that's amazing. 
and he's he's just running around with a cape. There you go. So very good good guys. Uh, if you get one, great. They're they're super mages. Are they nation defining? Eh, no, I wouldn't say so. We have good enough mages that that are fine. Some of these guys, like that nature dude, uh, he actually lets us do some of our national spells we otherwise couldn't do, but they're not vital spells, so I think these guys are two flavor. Next up, let's take a look at our regular commanders here. We have an Avite Scout. Uh, very good scout in that he is not going to die to some random thing. He does have Wasteland, Mountain, and Forest Survival. However, he's 55 gold a pop rather than the 25 to 35 that most scouts cost. So you definitely pay for it. And do you need a heavily armored scout? Probably not. So you might, you'll might you probably have to get a few of these guys, but you're hoping that you find independent scouts rather than use them. Next up, we have our basic commander. And we look out here. He's decent. He's a 100 leadership, so plus one morale for three squads. Remember, our troops are not the best morale, so any bonus we can get for them is appreciated. As an Avite, he has the standard Wasteland Survival, and he is decked out as if he is one of our standard Swordsman line troops. Completely serviceable. He leads plenty of troops. Um, he has decent stats. Do note he has 11 precision. If you find yourself in a circumstance where you can afford to give him a bow, that would be quite nice. He has 16 strength and 11 precision. Gives him something to do while standing behind troops that otherwise he wouldn't have anything to do. He does not have a javelin, so he is not going to be tempted to run out in front and throw that like sometimes the scripts oddly do. Uh, pretty good. Uh, beyond giving him a bow, I do think he's a, uh, a nation that... He belongs to a nation that would appreciate morale bonuses. So if you if you craft something up, and we do have fire, which has some of those type of items, things that could increase our leadership and give our morale bonuses, or even his own. He only has a 13. That's not the best. I prefer higher than that on my leaders. So you can run into instances where your big beefy giants just kind of turn tail and run just with some unlucky rolls. So keep that in mind here. Uh, he is also only one recruitment point. So generally speaking, I get him plus a scout or two of him when I have to stop getting mages to recruit. Next up, we have two priest level one sacreds. These are Avims, so they both have Wasteland Survival. The main differences here is the Kedisum is a male and the Kedosat is a female. Uh, the female does have 10 leadership. She brings all the boys to the yard, apparently. Um, yeah, they're chosen for their appearance rather than their intellect for both of them. So they, they are, they're the pretty ones that run the temples that you can pay a fee to. Uh, if you've read Gilgamesh, there you go. So these guys are kind of useful if you're using your sacreds or we have some sacred summons we're going to look at. We don't have any easily accessible holy twos. And the priests that we do have are ex very expensive, very rare, and they eat population. Whereas these ones don't. So I do tend to get a few, and I tend to get her just on the off chance I need to grab some troops and move them around. Uh, they're never going to want to be fighting. You're going to use them to throw out some blesses. Not much else to say about them. They will be your temple builders, and they may even need to do a little bit of preaching. Next up, we have the Horite Shaman. He is a very bad researcher. He does come with the standard Horite uh, traits, so he's got fire resistance, cold resistance, can see in the dark. He's really, really inefficient at researching because of that in an inept researcher six. However, he's our only death searcher. So I would grab probably two of these, and I would run around and get my death searching. And depending on how your game is going, maybe you can't get a nature two or an earth two at the time, and you can at least get some searching done for those two. Otherwise, he's going to maybe craft some low-level items for you. Maybe underground, you take him with you. It's a little bit more accurate than some of your other mages might be. I would never get more than a couple of these, though. And unfortunately, they don't have any random paths or anything, so you're never going to get to Death 2, which is where Death Mages really get useful. I guess of note, he doesn't have any special requirements. You can just recruit him out of forts. So that's nice. He's not like swamp only or anything, or cave only. So there's a little bit of a benefit there. Next up, we have the Ami. These guys are your main battle mage, and they are amazing. 
they have the standard wasteland survival. Uh, nine research for 136, though. Not efficient. Not efficient. I mean, there are people out there that way, way more efficient than this. However, you get two linked paths. Two fire, or two air, or two earth, or two astral. So every single one of these guys is combat usable. You can Phoenix power up to fire three. You can do most interesting fire things. You can do air two, which gives you mist form. Uh, you can do wind guide stuff. You can do lightning stuff. Maybe you try to do storms for some reason, and then you can get up to air three. We can earth power up to earth three, which lets us do basically all the good earth combat spells, including strength of giants, temper armor, iron skin, amazing buffs for our very buffable troops. Uh, with Astral, you could do Power of the Spheres up to three, which basically lets you do all the lower-end Astral stuff, including Anti-Magic, that you would want to do. And this is just our standard mage from any fort, not sold to recruit. Very nice. In addition to that, they are Fortune Teller 15. That's a pretty high Fortune Teller. Most are like five, maybe ten. So 15 is quite, quite good. Uh, this is a reason why I kind of him and haw if you want to take fortune for those heroes. Because we could use the points, and we have very strong fortune tellers. There's totally nothing wrong with having three or four of these sitting in each one of your forts researching. And just using their fortune teller to counter any bad events that you might get in your fort. Overall, very nice combat mage. They are not even that pricey front-loaded, honestly. I'll pay 170 gold for a not slow to recruit, guaranteed usable combat mage. Yeah, sure. Uh, 23 HP also means it's not uncommon that you catch an arrow and perfectly survive. You may not even take an affliction from that. That's pretty nice. Um, they are wearing robes that doesn't give them basically any protection. Uh, so if they can give themselves some defensive buffs, they sure appreciate that. Um, they're not pricey enough, though, that I would probably invest gems and defenses. Uh, if I was going to invest in gems on them, it would probably be boosters to do some special spell. Otherwise, I think you just use these out, like, off the assembly line. Next up, we have the Cha. Again, a very, very, very nice mage. Two nature, guaranteed. Uh, we have the... I think that's... Is that the same or very similar... No, our upkeep is actually higher, so these are even less efficient for research. However, they give us a supply bonus because they're nature mages. Uh, we actually will, we can possibly run into supply issues. We have big boys and we have gluttony boys, so that can be useful. And we have healer 2. That's pretty dang rare. With healer 2... Uh, you can quite keep an army on the march. I really, really like having a squad of light infantry or spearmen being led by a commander and one of these guys going with them. If you get Alteration 1 and Evo 1, or maybe, no, Evo 2, personal bark skin, eagle eyes, and then you can either vine arrow or you can web. It's really good, actually. Um, Put him on, cast a couple buffs, and then advance and cast. He'll get up nice and close, and he'll cast webs into the enemy, which helps counter our low attack density and guarantees hits against web things, because we don't have a bad attack, but it's not very good either. And to get out of a web, it's based on both, I believe, size and strength. So our troops are pretty good at just getting themselves out of web if you get some friendly fire, where other troops may really, really struggle to get out from that. And having a healer 2 really keeps, keeps your army on the march. You'll notice that you lose a significantly less amount of people to cripples and limps as you go. So I like these guys a lot. I do try to send one of these with every expansion party. And then when you run into those moments where like you can't expand, they can start searching for some nature, get some nature get gems rolling. I like them. I like them a lot. Um, also, because we have healer 2... And we have Astral 2. Uh, I'll swing back around to this when we talk about spells, but that opens up the possibility of maybe doing a little bit of mind hunting, which is a very interesting um, spell we will talk about later. But just keep that in mind by having a healer 2. 
Do note that Healer 2 does not cure disease. Those are two different things. So you can cure the things that disease causes, but not the root disease with this guy. Next up, we have the Kohen. This is a recruit from any fort. Uh, I believe he needs a lab anti temple. Um, I don't like these guys. I don't like these guys one bit. Blood 1, Priest 1, one random pathing of Fire, Earth, and Astral. Uh, they're very inefficient at 140 gold for 9 research. We are sacred. We have the fire resist. We have the giant scared of water stuff. We have the gluttony thing. We're a pop kill 20 and a cause unrest twenty or 2. So just having one of these guys around, what are you doing? Um, maybe blood hunting. We have better blood hunters. Maybe researching. Well, my other researchers don't eat people. So yeah, I'm not in love with this guy. Uh, he has a sensor attack. And it's a morning star that does some poison. I, I, it is air of effect. I'll give it that. Maybe, uh, I don't know, you give him a piece of armor and thug him? I don't know. I, I don't like this guy one bit. Next up, we have two usable ones. These are cap onlys. First, we have the ball. He's pretty baller. He has blood two guaranteed, priest level one. He gets three guaranteed levels of Fire, Earth, or Astral, and a 10% chance of the same plus blood. Uh, I get these guys because they will help you cast your National Blood spells that we're going to want to be doing. They have Fear, which is quite nice. They do have the Pop Kill, and we're up to 50 on this guy. And five Unrest. So if you have these guys hanging around, make sure you keep an eye on your Unrest and your Population. Don't hang out in low pop areas. Um, I don't get a lot of these. They're slow to recruit. They're cap only. They're 635 gold. They're 254 on upkeep. But they're usable and they have a purpose. Um, they might even be usable to do some thugging if you had something very specific. You'd have to give them a piece of armor and probably a better helmet. Um, and maybe a weapon, like, yeah, that, that, we're talking a lot of gems at that point, but at least he does have fear. That's very nice on super combatant. Well, he's probably thug tier, not super combatant tier. Um, but very nice to have. He does have some magic paths that are useful. Uh, fire shield or earth stuff or astral shield, whatever. He's usable. Uh, I get a few of them, but be careful, especially if you're stacking multiples in the same place. Finally, we have the, a milk cart. Uh, just like the uh, Baratos can summon these in. We actually can just recruit these. These are the same guys that Baratos deals with. Uh, 270 gold upkeep, 675 gold to recruit, and they're slow to recruit. However, Blood 3, very strong Blood Mage. There's not a lot of recruitable Blood 3s in the game. And we're Blood Searcher 3. So we Blood Hunt as if we are a 6 out of the box. In addition, we're an adept sacrificer. I believe this should equal... I believe this means we can do six sacrifices at the same time. Uh, that is a lot of blood sacrificing. That is a lot of blood sacrificing. Um, that's That can really push your dominion out. Otherwise, what else are they good for? Well, blood hunting. These are good. Uh, it is nice that they are very able to defend themselves against assassination attempts while blood hunting. I still get, generally give them two bodyguards because I don't want an oops moment for something this expensive. Other path-wise, they have fire, earth, and astral at plus two. If I was going to thug or super command, I would do it on this guy rather than the other guy. He also has fear. Um, however, we're wearing actual armor. Like, maybe give him a different helmet. Maybe. I'm not sure that would let him gore, though, if you give him a full helmet. He has a magic weapon right out the bat, so you don't even necessarily have to replace that. His armor is acceptable. We're at 19 protection. Uh, head is our weak point. Depending on the pathing that you get, different armor or spells would apply. Uh, very usable. We've moved up to 80 pop kill, though. And 8 unrest per turn for one of these guys. So if you have one of these guys leading 10 sacreds, you're eating a lot, you're causing a lot of unrest. So get them and get them out there doing something. Don't have him sit around eating people and getting fat. Very cool though, very usable. 
Um, I like to have these guys. Um, I like to have them help lead the summons that we get because uh, I don't have to worry about him running away. He's got 15 morale. Amazing leadership. Uh, do note, though, that people could pick him out on scripting uh, with attack large enemy monsters. So just note he is an arrow uh, magnet. However, he's he's rocking full magic gear, so uh, about as good as you can get on something like that. All right, who would I profit? Well, this is actually a pretty important decision. We don't have any anything above a Holy One uh, in our roster. We have to rely on uh, heroes or other sources. So we only going to have one Holy Three to go claim thrones and to bless big groups. Generally speaking, I do my first commander. Uh, it gives him something to do behind the line. Do note that he's at six encumbrance. That's relatively high. So even casting just your your holy spell that you get, he gets six fatigue every round. So he can't even do that forever without passing out. Uh, if he dies, who would I do? Um, I would probably do a milk cart. Uh, just to get rid of that ridiculous uh, upkeep. But maybe even not, because they do, they're just so expensive. Having one of him that only is going to do big blesses and some sermons of courage, that feels like a big waste to me. So I think this is your number one guy. Or perhaps summon something in and then give them your profit. So I think it's between those two. Maybe you're cheeky and you have a, you want a stealthy profit and you do it on Avite Scout. Uh, compared to doing that on other scouts, at least he has gear if he gets caught. Maybe, maybe that's a thing. I'm not too entranced with that, though. As for national items, we have no national items. As for national spells, we have several different uh, choices there. Uh, all of them are different summons. Let's go ahead and take a look at here. First up from Conjuration. We have the Mazic and the Lilot. I believe the Mazic come in at Conj 3. Let me double check here. Yeah. Conj 3, we get Mazum, and at Conj 5, we get the Lilith. The Mazic is essentially an imp. He's an imp in all but name, essentially. Uh, he is an actual demon. They're flying, they're stealthy, they have dark vision, they don't need to eat. I, these guys are actually pretty decent. Uh, for the cost of summoning them in, they only are uh, require a nature one mage and three gems, and you get ten of them. Uh, I like these, actually. They help fill in for your giants because they're size two, so they can squeeze into your regular infantry squares or support your big guys. Uh, maybe a sneaky little hold and attack rear when somebody hasn't seen you running around with these could be pretty good for killing squishy mages. Uh, nine attack... or 11 attack with 9 damage is respectable. And against a mage who's not, you know, armored and geared, that's that's fine. I think these are totally usable. The Lilut is essentially a succubus in all but name. Um, she is an actual demon. She does have dream seduction, uh, which means size 3 or lower, you can uh, seduce and fly back home. Otherwise, you need to be on your border. Um, dream seduction is okay. Um, it's often, I don't know, it says difficult to resist, but I tend to find it's actually pretty easy to resist. So she could try to seduce male commanders to your side. She does have the dark vision. Her melee attack is a life drain, but it's length zero. Uh, her problem is you need a nature four mage who, other than from heroes or summons, we don't have natively. Our big one, I believe, is only nature two. So you're looking at a thistle mace and an Empower or a, a more expensive item, and they cost 15 Nature Gems. I'm not 100% sold on these, but having that option is nice to have there. I think you'd probably be better off investing those either into the Mezic or into Cauldrons of Broth or other Nature Gems uh, summons or crafting. But again, having the option of that is quite handy. Next up, we have Blood Summons, and I'll just zip in there to show you. From Blood, we have Summon Serum at Blood 3. These are very similar to the Summon uh, that you get on Baratos, but more efficient. 
For 23 Blood Slaves, we get five of them. Only requires a Blood 2 to be able to summon, so our balls can do it right out of the gate. And yeah, 23 for 5 is pretty darn good. Now, unfortunately, we don't have an upgrade to that. So as you scale up your blood economy, if you want to do more and more of these, you are going to need more and more of those balls. And because of the pop eating and unrest causing, it kind of sucks having them uh, grouped up in the same place. However, can only be cast in wastelands. And I believe that's the same here. Yep, same there. And not on that one. Okay, so for our first two, it is Wasteland Summons only. For Baratos, that is a humongous hurdle. Because unless you're playing on a predefined map that you know will have Wastelands, there's no guarantee that your map will have Wastelands. However, on Hinnom, our starting province is a Wasteland. So unlike Baratos, we don't have to... Pray, pray to pretenders that we will get one. You're guaranteed that you can. Now, there is a downside to that, though. That also means that you're going to have all those pop kill, all those turmoil causing guys. Um, I had an event that killed one of mine. I had three of them here casting it. And you need to watch out for eating too much pop. Just be careful there. So in this game, one of the things I noticed was there's another wasteland over here. So I kind of purposely caused wars in that direction so that if I need to spread out, I can get a second spot for summoning. Can be uh, pretty important there. So those come in at three and four respectively. Let's actually look at the units. So these are the exact same units. We have the Seir, Claw Claw Gore, so three attacks, very high attack, very high damage. Uh, they go Berserk plus four, so those skyrocket even further. They are sacred. They have Dark Vision. Uh, very, very powerful, powerful Blood Summon. And the fact that we get five of these for 23, so they're like, what, four Blood Slaves and some change each? Worth it. 100% worth it. I really, really like these guys. And I think you should take a Blessing that affects these probably more than your Giants. Because they don't have the problem with pop eating. And they don't have the problem with unrest causing. So as you're building up your army, yeah, the guys summoning them have problems. But they're not going to cause even worse problems. If you didn't want them, or perhaps you want a ranged attack, you also can summon Shed. Uh, perfectly fine. They do have storm immunity. They do have storm power. So maybe this is an argument for going for a something that can cast storm. Uh, would help your air mages. And then these guys could get empowered by it. They have Air of Effect 1. It's a fatigue uh, natural weapon. So just like we saw on, like, Riley, um, maybe... Okay, these guys are going to have 7 fatigue per cast, so going 4 or 5 encumbrance, or 4 or 5 reinvigoration would drastically raise the amount of lightning they could throw. Is that worth it? Yeah, probably not. But it is food for thought. That could be pretty interesting. Finally, up at, I believe that's Blood 9. Let's just double check. Yeah. At Blood 9, we have Lords of the C of Civilization. Probably should show that, show that a little better. At 9, we have Release Lord of Civilization. So, 177 Blood Slaves. It requires Blood 8. So, very, very high blood. We can summon in those original Grigori Angels that caused all of this to happen. Uh, why would we want to do that? Well, they are absolutely amazing. These are some of the strongest units probably in the game. Um, just like the heroes, I'm not going to go individually, but for example, 35 in vulnerability. So if you don't have a magic weapon, you have to get through 35 protection. Shock resist. Fire resist, poison resist, flying. He can do dream corruptions, which is a type of uh, seduction thing. They are demons. It's a priest level four. He's got blood five, astral four, uh, earth two, fire three. He has the first sword. The first sword, guys. Come on. Uh, he's wearing armor. So even if you do have uh, something to get through in vulnerability, he could buff himself up to very high protection there. 
He has a 24 attack length, 347 damage sword. Like, this is ridiculous. He's flying. He has 98 HP. He's sacred, so he takes your bless. This guy, uh, he's not the fighter type, but 4 astral, 4 nature, 4 blood, 3 uh, priest level. This one is a hero or 3. Uh, this one is a fortune teller 20 with a bunch of other ones. Like, these guys are absolutely ridiculous. It's, uh, it is amazing. I did a, a Dom 5 game, a uh, single player. But I did get to these, and they were so much fun to use. Super combatants, to be sure, for each and every one of them. Uh, very, very nice. They also open up some more magic paths that maybe you didn't have. So, and at 177 blood slaves, that's a steal. You could get that really easily. So, very, very powerful, very cool, very, very thematic. Like, this one just looks so cool to me. I love that look. In fact, I think, I think you're going on the thumbnail, friend. Yeah, uh, these guys are just so dang cool. Very, very powerful, very cool. Um, and Blood is one of those ones that it's relatively doable to climb Blood by empowering if you have to. So, if you start with a pretender that doesn't have Blood... I mean, you already have at least a Blood 3 to start from. That's only six paths up. So, very doable. Uh, very doable. So, everything here we can cast natively, even if some of them are a little bit harder to do. That is a trait I greatly value in Nation. So, love to, love to see that. Okay, so let's bring all that together. We are a Nation that is expensive. However, for that price, we get good, reliable combat mages. We have a very strong sacred, but you have to be careful with it because he has downsides. We have very good troops, but they cost a lot of resources to recruit. We have some underground options, which is nice to have. Our only major uh, weakness is for magic is we don't have great death access. We don't have water access. Otherwise, we're pretty darn good there. Um, and those are not the worst things to be missing. We have decent income in our capital. We have good heroes. So we are a nation, I think I would play scales. Scales with a decent bless, which means I'm probably going either dormant or imprisoned on this nation. I don't think you need an awake expander. Your light infantry alone can definitely expand. Your spearmen can expand. I think they do just fine. You're not going to be the fastest expanders ever, but you're pretty reliable. Once you get some infrastructure up, you have very strong forts, so your income will be pretty decent. It is a little rough to get going, though. We're going to have a lot of things that cause unrest. We're going to have a lot of things that do pop kill. So in my mind, you're looking at a decent to strong bless and high scales. I think that's the route you need to go on this nation. You have very good combat mages, so you're going to be looking at probably spreading your research out at the beginning so that every one of these guys can do something good for you. However, once you have that nice base down, I mean, you have fire and, and earth three once they self-buff, maybe air three once they self-buff, astral three once they self-buff. That's a strong, not soldier recruit, not cap only mage that you can get. So very, very nice on that. As one of the kind of Middle Eastern culture group uh, nations, Hinnom has a pretty good variety of pretenders here. We've got kind of the Middle Eastern ones. We've got kind of uh, Mesopotamian ones. We've got some of the African ones. So quite a quite a good spread here. A little light on the Dom ones, I suppose. So you can try many different flavors here, I think, of pretender. As mentioned, I don't think you need an awake expander on this nation. I feel like you expand well enough without that. So I'm not sold on the Dom 2 guys, but if you are, I mean, the bowls are pretty good. Uh, many of these can be made to work, uh, kind of to taste. Do note that you have to kind of keep an eye on what scale they're going to be changing. If... I really feel like production is needed on this nation. So taking guys with sloth, taking people that lower your order, I, I'm not sold on that. I think that's a that's playing a risky game that you're hoping for really, really nice terrain and, and easy expansion, and I don't think you're guaranteed to get that. Uh, in the Titan realm, uh, I struggle with Titans often because they're just, they're pricey. Like 250, like... 
if it's not an awake one that can expand, like at least she could expand if I was going to go that route. I don't know. I'm I'm struggling with, with seeing these ones. Uh, they do have some of the classics, the good old uh, Anaki of Love and War, uh, everyone's favorite there. Uh, down for Dominion's one people, we only have generics. We don't have anybody special uh, because we're giants. Dom 2, nobody's special, um, like giant-wise or anything. We do have the Son of the Fallen, who is a Blood 3. Uh, he brings in that turmoil. He comes in with a high 120 pop kill, though. I'm not sold on him. Yeah, I'm not too sold on them. For me, I like to go something that's going to be imprisoned, bring in a good bless and high scales. So I'm probably looking more at the uh, Dom 4 guys and probably the Dom 4 immobiles. While the Bronze Colossus is cool, he's very expensive. Uh, same thing with the Wooden Colossus, very expensive. I don't think those are needed on this nation. Um, we do have the Divine Glyph, and we do get a 20-point reduction on the cost there. So, um, if you I was going to take this guy, I think I would definitely take him with enough Astral to be able to teleport. Gives him something there. Um, he does raise heat scales, but we've already done that. He does raise order scales, which could actually be useful for this nation. I could totally see a build here. Uh, fire and Astral. I don't know. You don't need magic weapons. I don't know. I'm not sold on that. I think what you're looking for is something that works for both your summonable demons and your recruitable troops. So you're probably going to want either region or uh, strong blood and something to keep them rolling. And then probably something just to add a little more oomph to their offense. For me, that's that's kind of the sweet spot for price to performance on them. Otherwise, I'm looking for those really high scales. Let me show you what I've come up with. I like this guy quite a bit in the test games I played him. I played two. We have Steak. This is a calf idol. So we get this relatively cheap. It is an immobile. I took him as Imprisoned. And I took Blood Surge and Enchanted Blood. So we have something that we can rock right away. That, that's that's fine. Like If you were even to rush for your Blood 3 summons, they're good enough with this. They, they're, they're ready to rock on that. And then later on, when your Calf comes in, Fortitude. Uh, Fortitude gives you half damage from Pierce, Slash, and Blunt weapons. So can be pretty darn nice to be able to be really survivable. Your... Summon demons, go berserk, and they go up to, I think it's 11 protection, which is pretty decent, but they have to take a hit first to go berserk, and before they take that hit, they're at 7, which, it's it's a little on the low side. So, ideally, with Fortitude, you'll get hit, you'll take very, very little damage, go berserk and up your defense to take even less damage. And at the same time, our Enchanted Blood is healing us up a little bit, giving us a little extra magic resistance against being banished, and all of our Sacreds are incredibly killy, so they're very, very able to pop Blood Surge for all those juicy, juicy stats that you can get from that. Scales-wise, I maxed out Order at 2, maxed out Production at 2. I was able to keep our Heat at 2. That is our natural spot. You could go up another one, however, uh, you risk Summertime taking you up to Heat 4 and, and causing us a pretty nasty pop kill. Uh, alternatively, you also could go down to heat one for some extra points. Um, there you risk getting snowed. We don't have any extra movement or anything. I think I would prefer to keep my rivers unfrozen so I'm not surprised by somebody being able to cross a frozen river suddenly or something. Uh, growth two, we are going to have a lot of pop kill going on. This will help just keep our economy ticking along uh, early on, hopefully get some growth. And build that up a little bit before we start harvesting uh, the crop, as it were. Uh, because of all that, we have lots of order. We have fortune tellers. I went with Misfortune 2. I had to pay for this somehow. So with Misfortune 2, that can be a little iffy. Uh, combined with order, though, uh, we have a less chance of having events. And with our fortune tellers that are easy to get. You can get a few of them in every single fort to protect your high investment spots. I think that's perfectly fine. And I grabbed a magic uh, scale. You could say, yeah, you're inefficient researchers anyways. Maybe you drop that scale. Maybe you, you lessen your misfortune by one. I could see it. Um, 
it's that's kind of to flavor. But I feel like this is a really good one. It let me get eight Dominion Strength, which is very strong. I normally don't go above six usually. But with eight here, I can get tons and tons of Sacreds out of my cap really quickly and then get them out. If I only had, let's say, five, okay, the leader takes two and he's slow to recruit, so I'm getting three the first turn, I'm getting five the second turn, I've only got eight of them in my leader, do I sit around and wait for another turn? Eight's not that many. This way I take two turns, I can get some sacreds if I want them, and then get them on the road. Get them out there and doing something. Uh, this also, we don't have good preaching. So if we're having Dominion problems, we're going to have to do blood sacrifices to try to fix it. Uh, this makes our temple checks very strong. So this also can be a good one if you want to use that offensively and do some blood sacrificing. A, a temple check made at 8 Dominion Strength is much more powerful than a, a lower uh, Dominion Strength temple check. So you can quite solidly push that um, Dominion out there. Very solidly. So I quite like this guy. Um, it is in the mobile, so having the Astral, you know, I didn't take any Astral here in my Bless. I took that because I needed to pay for this. This isn't this isn't the cheapest thing. I mean, Fortitude is seven Bless points, and then four and four. So this is a pretty heavy Bless, but this allows me to teleport him. This allows me to do a Gate if I need to. That might be relatively useful because we're going to probably have to do a lot of our summons in our capital unless we find a convenient wasteland. So I can do a whole bunch of summons and then he could gate them somewhere to the front as kind of like, hey, I need to win this apocalyptic battle for the victory. I would be willing to do that. Could be quite good there. Otherwise, he also could do some crafting. Do note that he is an inept smith, so this is acts as if it's Astral 5, but we can we can get various things in here, and having the Earth and Astral Crosspath is pretty good. We can make some different boosters. Having the Earth and Blood, we can make, uh, I think they're Bloodstones. There, there's various crafting things that he can do that other people can't do easily on our nation. Um, we don't have to rely on the random Earth 3 guy to make boots. He could make our own boots. He could make our first hammer if we just don't have somebody who can do that yet. So if if we get to that point, you know, he's in prison, so he's not going to be here anytime soon. But he can come out. He'll get our fortitude. So while he isn't the, the toughest dude around, I mean, 28 protection with fortitude. And he has, I think it's 15, yeah, 15 all elemental plus 25 poison. He's actually relatively hard to, to get rid of. Like, he's no monolith, but... He's not far from a monolith either. So he could be quite the, the roadblock if you had to. And being able to teleport, we could stick him in like a forded throne province that somebody's going to try to take while we're trying to like rush a victory. And he could just hold that like a monolith does and just roadblock them. So overall, I quite like this guy. Um, Kind of interesting. Uh, I normally don't do Imprisoned. We did one on Relay, but other than that, I don't think I've done one on Stream. So a second Imprisoned example here. A very, very high Dominion that I normally don't do. And a, a really good Scales build, I feel, with a little bit of flexibility. You definitely could tweak the Heat around. You definitely could tweak the Misfortune and uh, Magic Scale around. So a little bit there. Like You could sacrifice a lot of that, and you could probably get yourself up to just dormant. Uh, you definitely could. If you dropped Fortitude, in fact, let's let's make one of these guys. If we dropped Fortitude, what would we do? So we'll jump into Hinnom. Yep. 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 All right. So let's say we're going to go dormant and we want to do blood stuff. And note that our special summons do not have a plus. So having higher blood does not get us more summons. Let's say we just went with Blood Surge and Enchanted Blood. So not, nothing too crazy here. We need two more points. Probably just keep it super on the cheap. Something like that or maybe a little more expensive and go that way. We'll start here. Let's say six Dominion. I mean, heck, we could even start awake if we wanted to at that point. We'd still get three scales. But let's keep it dormant. Let's see what we can get. Yeah, look at that. Uh, we could go... We could grab another path in here. 
Uh, that would give us one extra point. If I had one extra point, I would get strong Vitae for an extra HP on my Sacreds. Uh, I don't particularly think that's great. So I think we're looking at either a scale or Dominion 8. So, I mean, let's let's say we want to increase our odds a little bit of getting one of our heroes, and then we could afford that. Exactly on zero. Perfectly balanced as everything should be. Uh, I, I quite love it when you can do that. So this guy's totally viable. Like, that Fortitude thing is kind of a greed, a greed pick on my part. Uh, he would come in relatively early, you know, only about a year. This doesn't, he doesn't even need to be out to do this bless. He's going to come in. He's going to be a strong researcher for you. Do note that this version does not have Astral. So you are not moving. This is a cap only guy. But he can do some research for you. He could get uh, riches from the Earth cast for you. He can do your summons without having somebody causing unrest and eating the population. This guy's usable. He's totally usable. Uh, nothing wrong with this. Um, plus one RP. Yeah, this this is not bad. Events plus one percent. So with our extra little bit of luck. Now, even even when you are going fortune, it is still good to have fortune tellers because you're still ending up with more events. Even if the scales are tipped towards them being good, more events mean more bad events will happen in totality. So. Uh, yeah, I, I will quite like this build too. Who knows, maybe I even change my mind and we'll run this guy. And let's say we wanted to be even different, like we wanted him awake for some reason. We could totally scale this back relatively easy. Like, we just drop that, we drop that. Maybe we drop the temp a little bit. Boom, now he's awake. Um, does this hurt? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. But I, I wouldn't take this guy's awake though, just to throw that out there. But just to show you, like, this is a very versatile chassis. He's just so dang cheap. And Earth and Blood are good paths for what we have. Other things you could consider, blessing-wise. Um, hard Skin works pretty well on our summons, less so on our recruitables. For our recruitables, I think Unbreakable would be quite good for them. Um, because they are giants, they tend to not die in combat too bad until they've racked up a ton of afflictions. Once they have a ton of afflictions, that's where you're going to see them start a tritting away. So uh, Unbreakable would be pretty good there. Other things to think about. I think Regen is very strong on both sets of things. Maybe you do something cheap, like you'd have to change chassis here, but mm, do we have a Blood Nature chassis? I, don't, I doubt we do. That's usually kind of rare. 100 points. See, th these are hard to recommend because they're all 100 or 110 points. This guy is 110 and he has better pathing by a lot. Uh, this guy is... 90 and again I like the pathing there. Um I don't know. Let's let's say this guy just I don't know if he's good or bad or what, but let's just take him. We will go up to 7 for the region. We need 4 here. So we do regeneration and blood surge and we'd probably have to go dormant on this guy. But again, like we're close already on on price. Um Yeah, you could you could totally fill, figure around here like we're going to need something like that. This is well, more on the pricey side. Yeah, see, I wouldn't go this route. Like, we're now we've lost our scales. Not worth it. Just not worth it. Go with go with somebody else who's cheaper, and you can get the best of both worlds, in my opinion. I will show off, as a final note here, in my latest test game. I feel like this was a pretty middle-of-the-road run. I started in an okay spot. I did have a throne in my cap circle, as per usual. Uh, I have one fort, two forts, um, three forts that I built. I captured an enemy capital. I found one. I am in a war with Machaka at the moment. I'm going to have their cap, hopefully. They have a really annoying god that's kind of been skirmishing with me really badly. But my expansion was fine. Now, my dominion looks kind of bad. I'm kind of surrounded pretty closely on every side. I'm considering starting to do some blood sacks to really push it. Do note, though, that in my core provinces, I am very high in Dominion. I'm not in any danger here. It's just, it takes a lot of candles to push out. Because I have to fill these up with eight or nine candles to be able to move it out. So, my early game, I expanded to here, and I bumped into Ur. And then I expanded on this side, and I found some Amazons here, which I really wanted. So I kind of rushed over here. 
And then I just kind of bulked out until I ran out of room. And then I started an early war with Kalem. And I decimated Kalem, actually. Uh, in the early game, before they get their magic up or they can afford their more expensive stuff, our troops just outclassed them. They flew into my archers, and my archers just stabbed them. They didn't even care. I don't even know if I lost an archer on two two apocalyptic battles, essentially, at Kalem. So, a great nation. Um, you're vulnerable before you get your economy going, and then you're vulnerable a little bit before you get your blood economy going. But once you have those two cylinders uh, going, uh, you are great. You're in an absolutely great place. So, very fun. I really enjoyed both of my test games. Um, I was planning on doing underground stuff to test that a little bit. And, of course, Abyssia beat me there. And Circumstances in this game have been that I just haven't been able to start another war. I've just been in war after war the whole way through so far. Okay, so those are my thoughts on Hinnom. An incredibly cool nation. Incredibly fun. Um... If you ignored their blood stuff, they wouldn't even be that bad for just a beginner nation. Uh, I do feel like once we start using the turmoil-causing, blood-hunting type guys, pop-eating guys, this is like an intermediate nation, at least, because that is a little bit tricky, and you can kind of screw yourself if you're not careful with how you're managing that. But very, very usable troops, quite, quite fun to use, decent variety. They all have roles to play, and a very reliable combat mage makes this just a very fun nation to play okay builders thank you for checking out hinnom with me as per usual i'd love to hear any thoughts people have especially if you've played them yourself uh, other blesses other chassis you like i don't know i feel like i'm being a little hard on their chassis choices here because just nothing else stands out to me i am a sucker for the uh the calf idol so maybe, maybe I'm just being swayed by its mesmerizing uh, golden sheen. So if you have another chassis build you like, I'd, I'd love to hear that. Uh, last week's video was on Relay, and I got some amazing feedback and was able to improve my build on that uh, god. And we had a, a hard but fun stream. So I'm hoping, as usual, to just hear what other people think, what other people have tried, uh, what you love about them, what you hate about them, uh, any other tips you have. Okay, builders, have a good week, and I will see you on stream.